Well, we're entering my favorite time of the year. Uh, my favorite uh, holiday, of course, is the celebration of the resurrection in an emphasized way. But the truth of the matter is we, every Sunday we gather, we celebrate the, the resurrection. But this season where we enter into Thanksgiving and heading into Christmas, it's just... It's just my favorite time of the year. And I, I pray that you as well are excited, making plans. We're going to get to uh, this Thursday, see, Lord willing, see all the family in. Clifton and Joanna will be coming in with their children. Karen will be making her amazing dressing. Uh, I grew up eating my mama's dressing which partially explained um, my physique. But, and I thought, I thought no one will ever be able to make dressing as well as my mama. But I will eat my wife's dressing because I love her. But you know what? I think she's beat it. She makes a dressing. Every now and then we come to Thanksgiving and she said, well, I don't want to make, make dressing this year. And we did just a revolt. And rightly so. Because, uh, because we want... Uh, we want to eat that together. Today we're looking again uh, at this 14th chapter. The 14th chapter is pretty long in, in 1 Corinthians. And as you, you've been tracking with us, you know that, that Paul has prepared this by laying out in chapter 4 the discussion of the charismata, uh, the, the, the grace gifts, chapter 12. And then chapter 13... He inserts this more excellent way because the grace gifts were not being appreciated or expressed in Corinth with a, with a drivenness by love. The party spirit that he described in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians was manifesting itself in the charismata. Selfishness, not selflessness was showing up. And so, so he's come to this 14th chapter having set the table in the 12th chapter, having shown the more excellent way in the 13th chapter, to now deal with what the issue has been since chapter 1, really. To show the superiority of prophecy over the fascinating expression in Corinth called tongues. That was what was driving the train, the, the so-called remarkable gifts. Uh, and he makes quite a statement <laughs> when he contrasts. If you want to get Paul's sense of the superiority of prophecy to tongues, five words in prophecy, 10,000 words in tongues. If you want to do the math on that, that prophecy is 2,000 times more important than tongues. And yet, all around us today, I mean literally, where we live, all around us today are people who would have us believe that tongues is the sine qua non. It is that with, without equal uh, manifestation of what it means to be a Christian. So we're looking at the, for the second time today at this discussion, chapter 14. We're in verses 1 to 19 right now. We'll move into the next section when we work through verse 19. Find that in your Bibles, if you would, as we think about the superiority of prophecy and the practice of tongues. Stand with me, if you would. We're going to read all 19 verses today, and then we're going to focus in on verses 6 to 12. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. 
Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for the battle? So with yourselves. If, your tongue, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, that's Paul's d- description of what was going on. Speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. And the word there is barbarian. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, if one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he, therefore one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you're saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And believe me, there is sufficient revelation here to help straighten us out on this matter that is so confusing to so many who live in this area. Thank you. Please be seated. We told you last week that these verses 1 to 19 take up the the importance of tongues uh, that's secondary to the importance of prophecy. We told you we'll be looking further at the the purpose of tongues as a sign for unbelievers, and finally the proper practice of tongues uh, should be systematic and orderly. We'll see that all through at the end of chapter 14. But last week we we dug into verses 1 to 5, and I pointed out then to you a couple of things. One was that the the building up notion, because we studied in chapter 12 that, that the charismata, the grace gifts, are for the edification of the church. And so Paul uses this contrast that the prophesying builds up and edifies. Tongues does not edify the church. So he puts them at odds with one another, even, even basically questioning what is happening there. It, can that properly be placed into the charismata? Because it does not edify. It does not build up the church. Today, uh, we're going to look at how uh, tongues do not edify the church. I told you last week, and I I came across this with John MacArthur, and I told you last week I rejoiced when I found it because it's something that when we were studying this uh, in seminary, when I I got past my master's and went back to do my doctorate, we did did an entire semester on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit at the doctoral level, and and in, in being immersed in these passages then it struck me as odd that either Paul was being schizophrenic I don't believe that for a second or he was being sarcastic to make a point with the Corinthians about how they were abusing some things and then I came across in John MacArthur's commentary on 1 Corinthians where he called it what he called an interpretive key to understanding the passage was the difference between the use of tongue singular, which is how he describes what's happening in Corinth, speak in a tongue. And I think that's what we talked last week about how some, some translations have unknown tongue. 
Contrasting that with tongues, which would be the speaking of foreign languages. That when you read through four, chapter 14, all the way down to the end, even, we just read that, that there's this tongue versus tongues. And if you don't understand what's going on there, you're going to miss uh, much of what Paul's saying. And when you come through that, you realize that that a believer with the genuine gift of tongues, being able to speak foreign languages, was never to exercise that in the public arena of the gathering of the people of God unless he himself could interpret it or there was someone who could interpret it. And I pointed out to you last week, I don't know a lot of Russian, but I, I rattled off a little Russian last week, not to impress you, but to show you that when I say that, you didn't have a clue what I was saying. And some of you could pop up and, and throw some Haitian at us, and we'd be scratching our head. In fact, uh, end of February, early part of March, God willing, you need to pray about this, we're going to have uh, Pastor Joseph, Pastor Denny, and his wife, Madam Mayor, uh, with us here. We're working on that's in the pipeline, and if all the government agencies cooperate, God willing, they'll be with us, and you'll hear a lot of Haitian. And I promise you, if you don't have an interpreter, it might as well be Greek to you. I mean, it's, it's, and so we're going to see that experience when they come. And so Paul's very careful that you do not use this uh, for private edification. And you can't even make the argument, well, aren't I part of the church? Yeah, didn't, aren't tongues designed to edify the church? Well, can't I edify myself? Wow. It's others, 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 others. This notion, this, this generation that's coming to the church, me, 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 my, mine, is not New Testament. It's a Western perversion of Christianity. And so we talked about that last week to build up the church, edify the church. So the, the text today, verses 6 to 12, the tongue, tongues does not edify the church. Paul starts out, he, well, let's read those verses. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, if I, a pro, a, a, an apostle, he said this in Galatians, by the way, if you remember Galatians, he said, if I come back to you preaching a different message than I preached before, don't believe me, may I be accursed. If an angel comes to you and speaks a different gospel than I get, may that angel be accursed. So he's using the same kind of mentality here. If I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching. Not even an apostle is an exception to the rule that what he says should edify, should build up, should instruct, should inform, should follow the pattern of the, of the value of Scripture, that it's all profitable. Well, the, the argument, of course, is this. If an apostle can't do that, it's the argument of the, of the greater to the lesser. Then, then no one in the New Testament church could rightly claim what an apostle could not legitimately claim. And then he uses a couple of analogies here. One is of a, uh, of a musical instrument being played. Uh, by the way, there was a music hall in Corinth. It held 20,000 people. It was famous for its wonderful concerts. So these people understood what he was saying. If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? Uh, Friday night, the uh, Askel troubadours uh, were, were wandering around the boulevard at uh, the Dickens on the Boulevard in Claremont. We went over to hear them. And, and it was, it was really rich. They were, they were unplugged, all uh, acoustical instruments, guitar, uh, violin, a uh, couple of tin whistles, tin whistles. And so I thought, I need to illustrate this. So I'm going to ask Petra and Jonas to come up here for just a moment and bring your tin whistles with you. Do you have them with you? Well, go get them. Missed a real treat, by the way. Uh, they were playing some Christmas songs, and it was just, uh, it was rich. They were dressed up in the period. Uh, 
It was like I had walked into great expectations or a Christmas carol or something. Hadn't been there, you need to check it out sometime. All right, I want you two to play. You know what symphony is? Symphony is symphonia. It is sounding together, symphony. Cacophony is from the Greek word uh, kakao, which means bad, bad sound. Symphony, sounding together. Cacophony, bad, Dis discordant. I want you two to just play something real quickly for me on your tin whistle together, okay? All right, if you're a big Pirates of the Caribbean fan, yeah, then you probably recognize that, that song from Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, Davy Jones' theme. We're going to change it up a little bit. May I have you tend with Jason, turn this mic on so I can turn mine off. I don't send these people to the hospital here. That was symphony. That was cacophony. <laughs> and that was Paul's dealing with here. Thank you. You can go sit down. If even lifeless instruments, such as a flute or a tin whistle, I was going to do this with a violin, but a couple of concerns I had was that I wasn't sure I could hold it right, and I didn't want to send any of you to the hospital, really. Pelly plays it so beautifully, but if you get me on a violin, if it, particularly cat lovers would just go into a trauma because it would sound like a cat was being slaughtered or something for me to play that. All right. A flute or the harp do not give distinct notes. How will anyone know what is played? That's what he is saying about what's happening in Corinth. There is no way you can read this passage honestly and, and think that Paul is justifying what is going on. The best he is doing is using sarcasm to get it under control, to bring it to be diminished. And he shifts his metaphor from, from what they would think is the concert hall where they've gone to hear beautiful concerts. To the battlefield, if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for the battle? If the bugler, with his best intentions, plays call to arms, and it sounds like what I was just doing on the tin whistle, it is confusion. And there is nothing gained by an army that is put under that confusion. They will be in disarray rather than, rather than armed and focused on the battle at hand. And so with these two analogies, Paul is telling us what he thinks about what's happening in Corinth. It is cacophony. Now, imagine for a moment. That when you came in here, I mean, what you just experienced me doing with Jonas was awful enough. But imagine when you came in, if we'd handed each of you today a tin whistle and said, now when the pastor says to play holy, 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 you give it your best shot. What you might have had is a couple of young people belting out holy, 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 but the, but the awful sound it would have been coming from every other quarter, which, by the way, was comforting to me to know that I would have had friends playing along with me, would be atrocious, would not be edifying, 
would not even qualify to happen in the context of worship. Brothers and sisters, that's what is happening in many places that would have you believe that that is ordained by God. If you watch any TV and you're familiar with Benny Hinn crusades and the just absolute cacophony and, and foolishness of him taking off his jacket and, and waving it and people falling down like fools, or a Joel Osteen meeting where they all get work. You can just fill in the blank. There are scores of these people. And to suggest that that is divine worship ordained by the God who is a God of order and not a God of confusion is an insult to the living God. And this is what Paul was feeling, I'm convinced, because of the language he uses. And he goes on and says, so with yourselves, verse 9, if you're, with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible. And I, and I think that word is sort of a death nail to what's going on there. He doesn't say misunderstood. The word is not intelligible. Multisyllabic, non-articulate, gibberish is what he's dealing with here. When I was doing the doctoral seminar on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, Two things happened that really struck me. There was a church in the Dallas area. I was in Fort Worth studying. There was a church in the Dallas area. It was the, one of the fastest growing churches in the country at the time. Uh, it was known, uh, it was a Baptistic church known for its emphasis on the charismata, on the spiritual gifts. And we had occasion to go over to a Wednesday night service. And it was one of the most disturbing things I had ever experienced at that point in my life. As it looked to me like people were being manipulated and had, they clearly had been taught that the more, more ecstatic, the more frenzied you became, the more spiritual it was. <clears throat> so I took that in and I, and I went away and was just, it was just very uh, transformational for me in terms of not not discussing hypothetically these things, but experiencing it and recalling against it as something that was not of the Spirit of God. Then another thing happened. We read a story about a fellow who had, who had gone into a popular uh, church, again known for its emphasis on the charismata, particularly the remarkable gifts, and participated in a service where he had his recorder with him. And he recorded... Uh, the pastor, in an episode of tongue speaking, as he said, and he recorded some other people doing that. And in the service, the pastor, someone spoke in tongues, and the pastor gave the interpretation for what was said. So the man set up a meeting with that pastor to talk with him in his office. He took his recording, and he said to him, he said, I understand that you have the ability to interpret tongues. He said, yes, I do. It's a gift God's given me. He said, so if I played a tongues episode for you, would you be able to interpret it for me? He said, oh, if, if God helps me, I would, yes. So he played tongues episode that the pastor had interpreted in the service. He played that episode for him. He said, do you think you can interpret that for me? And the pastor, on the spot, gave an interpretation of what was just said. Then the man said, well, when this was spoken in the church service such and such time, here's what you said it meant. And he played his interpretation for him. And they weren't even remotely associated. The pastor ordered him out of his office as a, as a fraud, as a, you know, just, you know how that happens. But that was striking to study about that. Brothers and sisters, I'm not, I'm not trying to get down on people who practice it. I pray for them. I pray, I pray that their, later, their leaders would get right before God and that they would not be misled. But our God is a God of order, not of confusion. And Paul's going to talk about languages here in, the, in, in a moment in the world, many languages in the world. 
But when you say something in a language, though they can be nuanced, it means what it meant when it was said, and it doesn't mean anything else later on. And when you can string together, and people have done this, experts have done this, where they've taken tongue-speaking experiences and typed out the, the, this, this multi-syllabic, syllabic, uh, multi uh, expressions. The order of these syllables will mean what they mean when they're here, when they occur later, they should mean the same thing. And when they do not, then you're not dealing with language ordained by God. When God confused the people at Babel so that they could no longer understand one another and they went their way with a, with a new language superimposed upon them divinely by God, they did develop communities who could understand one another various communities. And when our missionaries today go into the places, the unreached places where there is not a Bible written down in their language, and they listen and they learn and the Wycliffe translators come in and they, they study the language and they pick up language patterns and they begin to associate by, by, you know, say something and point to something what it is and they begin to build the vocabulary from that. It means what it means once it's established. My point I'm trying to make to you is that Paul is very concerned about what's happening in Corinth because it, it has more in common with the, with the uh, eros language of the, of the frenetic worship experiences they were having in the pagan temples. It has more in common with that than it does with what we would call meaningful, orderly speech. He says, if you speak that which is not intelligible, verse 9, which is a measurement for language, it must be intelligible to someone else or it doesn't qualify as a language. How will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. You're just, you're just making, making sounds. Remember what he said. a gong, or a cymbal in 1 Corinthians 13. Sounding gong, clanging cymbal, tin whistle in the hands of someone that doesn't have a clue how to play it. Verse 10, there are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner. The word there is, is barbar. It's, it's the word barbarian. And so the idea of barbar, of just talking nonsense. I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me. To the speaker, and the speaker, a foreigner to me. One night when we were in Russia, our interpreter did not show up. And my friend and I were sitting in this apartment with three families, precious families. We had a meal together. It was incredibly frustrating. We tried our best to try to my friend who was with me had been uh, in the military, served with the NSA. His job in the NSA was to listen to Russian transmissions, so he recognized things like bomb, tank, those kind of things, <laughs> which were of no help visiting with three families. We were not talking about war, but it was an incredibly frustrating experience, and I ached. We called our, 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 our uh, 
interpreters, interrupters, you know, because as you're preaching, and they, <laughs> Norman's done this, where he preach in Haiti, he, you say something about 10 words, and then for, the interpreter goes on for two or three minutes, you know, and they're interrupting what you're saying. But I, I, I was desperate for an interrupter that night to help us communicate and connect. So Paul says, don't do that. Don't, don't settle for that. Don't embrace that. That is not edifying. That does not build up the church. It does not advance the gospel. It hinders the gospel. Verse 12, so with yourselves. Now, he's made this clear argument here. Since you are eager. Now, he's not trying to pour cold water on their desire to be, to be filled with the Spirit and express their charismata for the glory of God and the building up of the, of the body of Christ. Since you are eager, so he commends their eagerness. The answer is not be passive or be unconcerned. Since you're so eager for the manifestation of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. He basically says, this is the matrix you drop over the whole matter. Will this edify? In fact, it's, that's the truth with the tongue. Being a critic grows on Adam's vine. It doesn't take any grace to be a critic. It comes naturally. A skeptic, harsh person, a downer. Anybody can do that. That's Adam's stuff. But build up the church. That takes grace. And then to use the charismata, the spiritual gifts, to build up the church. He says that should be the measure of what you're engaged in. He's going to go further now. He's not finished with them by a long shot. But I think you will agree if you follow what he said and if you you embrace the analogies and even even the visible portrait that he is not happy with what is happening in Corinth and does not regard it as belonging in the list of the spiritual gifts. There is a spiritual gift of tongues where you cross language barriers and connect. I promise you, brothers and sisters, I longed for the imbuement of that gift that night in that Russian apartment so we could bridge the gap and fellowship in the gospel. But when you make Jesus Christ the center of things, then then the outflow is thoughts toward God You want to love God. You want to love others, which means you want to bless others. And you want to serve the world. Jesus Christ saves any sinner. Five words. Intelligible. Understandable. And much more valuable than thousands of words put together by multi-syllabic gibberish that no one understands and more likely than not two supposed interpreters would not interpret the same. In fact, one interpreter might not interpret the same if the need for interpretation happened on different occasions. This is tied to the sovereignty of God. Our God is a God of order, glorious. And any expression of giftedness should reflect his glory, reflect his order, reflect his blessing, reflect his love for the church, his desire for the church to tell the story, the story. So what is your story? What is your song? I hope it's a commitment to the clear expression of the gospel, praising your Savior all the day long. And we're entering into a season now that's prompted perhaps more than any other season of the year to just provoke you to do that. Use your tongue to glorify God, to exalt Jesus Christ, to edify one another, And bless those you're going to encounter this week with the glorious good news that no matter how bad things look around you, no matter how bad things are happening to you, there is a Savior. 
there's a Savior who will save, transform, and keep to the end. I pray that you know him here today. I pray that you do. If you do, tell him. Tell others about him. If you don't, you can know him right now by repenting of your sins and trusting in him to be your Savior. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we bow before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we look at this passage and, and some of the things are so clear that we would say we, we reject the notion of what was happening in Corinth and we recognize the, the uh, wrongheadedness of much that happens around us in this area. But dear God, help us to see that, that we are guilty ourselves if our tongues are sheathed, if our tongues are silenced, if our tongues are not clearly, intelligibly declaring that Jesus Christ saves any sinner. Help us, Lord, to be found faithful in doing that. Help us not to make it about us, as they were doing in Corinth, but to make it about him, to make it about Jesus, blessing others, serving others who desperately need to hear the gospel. And so to that end, we pray that the gospel will go forth to every nation under heaven, the good news that there's a Savior who saves sinners. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.